Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm here with Dr. Manuel Vargas. He is a professor in the Department of Philosophy at UC San Diego, where he teaches classes on various topics, including, including ethics, the history of Mexican philosophy, and whatever it is is thinking about with respect to agency, moral psychology, and sociality. So, Dr. Vargas, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Thanks for having me. Okay, great. So, uh, we're going to focus our conversation today mostly on topics regarding free will and moral responsibility and related things. So, the first question I would like to ask you is, isn't it a bit tricky to talk about free will in philosophy? Because there are different ways to think about it, correct? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think uh, it, so, you know, as with any philosophical dispute, it's going to turn out that uh, there are different substantive theories that people are committed to. Of course, um, it wouldn't be much of a philosophical puzzle if there weren't a number of, of potentially viable uh, substantive theories. But I think part of what uh, makes the philosophical disputes about free will uh, as difficult as they are, it's not the only thing, but one of the things that makes it difficult, I think, is just that um, there are a variety of different uh, one way to think about it is is conceptual roles or uh, a, a number of different things that that people want out of a concept of free will. And so uh, so some of the disagreements turn out to be disagreements about even just the kind of what's the nature of the category that that we're employing to, to when we use the label free will, what kinds of conceptual categories are we picking out? And so and there's robust and reasonable disagreement about about whether or not free wills it got a special privileged attachment to one or another of those roles. Mm -hmm. So first we have to try to define what we are talking about when we talk about free will and only then can we decide if it really exists or not. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I, so, uh, or at any rate, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a condition on us being able to even know what we're talking about that we're clear, I think, uh, about what sorts of usage or categories or concerns we have. So, for example, sometimes philosophers are worried about uh, some or another set of capacities or abilities in virtue of which it makes sense to hold people responsible, to, to blame them or not. And that's one set of conceptual roles that might be very different than a set of conceptual roles that have to do with, for example, what sorts of beliefs do we have about ourselves when we're deliberating about what to do. And it could turn out that the things required to, to make sense of or for it to turn out that our beliefs about ourselves under deliberation, the things that are required to make those kinds of claims turn out to be true or credible might turn out to be very different sorts of things than are required for questions about uh, holding people to account or the justification of things like praise and blame. And those things might be different than questions about what sorts of abilities or capacities people would need to have that uh, mark us out as significantly different, for example, than other parts of the causal order or that make sense of us being uh, distinctive and original sources of action that can't be traced back to other prior sorts of things. All of these questions are at least in principle separable from one another. And philosophers sometimes think that some of these questions clump together, but it's not obvious to me that we have to think that they clump together or that, that the answer to one of these questions entails the answer to the other questions. Mm -hmm. So it's also important to take seriously the intuitions that uh, common people, let's say, have about free will and how they apply those same intuitions to different domains, like, for example, the legal system and thinking about moral responsibility. I'm asking you this because I was just wondering, let's say that philosophers or scientists were to finally solve the question and determine that free will exists or not. I mean, would that really have any bearing on how people would structure, for example, their societies in terms of those kinds of questions about how to structure their legal systems and how to hold other people accountable for their actions and things like that? 
Yeah, good. So I think there are, I mean, there's a couple of different questions here. So, um, so I think one, uh, one of the important questions that you're asking has to do with whether or not uh, the discoveries of scientists and philosophers, what would it take for, for claims of scienti scientists and philosophers to be vindicated and what's its relationship to folk thinking? Yes. So I think one thing you could end up thinking is that these things come apart. That is, it, it could just turn out that the way f the folk tend to think about free will is a bit like the way the folk tend to think about physics. We ha everybody's got views about how uh, objects move through space and how these things operate, but it just turns out human beings have, the, the folk oftentimes have systematically false beliefs about the way in which physics operates. And it just turns out working physicists, uh, you know, maybe that's a hurdle they have to get around or people who are teaching other people how to, you know, the nature of physics, they don't worry too much about what folk thinking is about it because the thought is we have a pretty good account about how physics operates in lots and lots of domains. And so it just turns out to be irrelevant what the folk think for doing physics. I think in the case of free will, things are a little more complicated. I mean, I think it, it could be that it turns out that our very best account about free will ends up being at some remove from what laypersons think. And I think that's just what happens with theorizing in any domain. That is, that people who think about this professionally and it's part of their intellectual preoccupations, that, that it, we should expect that good theorizing is going to have features about it that are not going to always show up in everyday folk thinking. That's part of the point of doing the theorizing. And sometimes one of the results of doing the theorizing, not always, but sometimes, is that it turns out our best theory about something turns out to have these important departures from folk thought. Mm -hmm. But the sense in which I think, at least when we're doing free will, it's, it's very natural to start with folk thought is because it's not like we have a free willometer. It's not like we have some device we can just point at the world and say, aha, we've discovered free will over here and not over there. And it's not as though we have widespread consensus amongst uh, theorists about what it is that the, the property or feature is of the world that we are looking for when we talk about free will. So some of that point I was making before about, look, there are these just different conceptual roles that people have used free will to pick out over, over history and current discourse means that that uh, you could think that the only way to settle questions of the priority about like which of these usages is the usage that that we should be focused on one natural answer to that question is well the usage that should be privileged or that is the proper target of philosophers and scientists is whatever the usage is of the folk when we talk about free will and it could turn out that the folk are picking out some feature of the world Maybe not, but right. it could be that they're picking out some feature of the world for which they're really referring to that feature of the world, even though they might have lots of false beliefs about it. But even so, we, we still might want to start with the folk because the, that, in some sense, narrows the conceptual space or the space of possibilities for what a theory could be about. And it might be, you could think, and I think this is contestable, but you could think it's our only way to... to, to um, to fix the category, to know what, what it is we're even talking about at all. If we don't start with the folk, then we don't have a way to do that. So that's one re reason why I think the folk sometimes think those kinds of, or why, why philosophers and scientists oftentimes want to start with the folk. Now, the second kind of question you were asking is, so suppose it turns out that philosophers and scientists um, come, come to the conclusion that in fact, uh, there's no defensible conception of free will. It turns out that whatever our best account is, we go out into the world, we look for it, and it's not there. What would follow from that? Well, I think part of what would follow from that depends on what you think that conceptual role is. So if the conceptual role is something like, what I mean by free will is the kinds of beliefs we have about ourselves and what possibilities are available to us when we're deliberating about what to do. If that's what you mean by free will, then uh, then it's so if it turned out we just had false beliefs about alternative possibilities being available to us when we deliberate that by itself, if that's all free will is, it might or that's all the kind of practical upshot of free will is, we might just conclude something like, well, we just have false beliefs under deliberation and we can't get rid of it any more than we can get rid of false beliefs we have about. Um, you know, I don't know, pick any number of, uh, of, uh, of kind of psychological mistakes or perceptual mistakes that we're inclined to make. And, and this just gets filed away as another perceptual mistake we're prone to making. But 
The more interesting and I think the more powerful uh, worry or skeptical threat about free will is the one that's tied to the thought that, well, what we really want out of free will is we want an explanation or identification of some feature of human beings in virtue of which our practices of, of fault finding and moral responsibility and culpability and blameworthiness, all of that network of concepts, um, makes sense. And it's so if you have that stuff, then you then you can be a target of those attitudes. And if you don't have that stuff, you don't have free will or whatever that special category is or features are that make these practices make sense. If you miss that sort of thing, then I think if you don't have it, then um, then it looks like there are real practical upshots. The practical upshots being that that it would be, in some sense, a mistake, maybe, or unjustifiable for us to blame one another. And and people have gone on to think. I mean, it's there's a kind of interesting question here about how far down the line the, the this set of conceptual linkages go, right? So the thought goes. Um, if free will is required for responsibility and there's no free will, then then you might think nobody's morally responsible. And then if you thought nobody was morally responsible, you could think uh, that uh, nobody is blameworthy or sorry, uh, that uh, that if nobody's responsible, that nobody's blameworthy, but that you can't have criminal law and criminal punishment without a notion of moral culpability. And so if you had the kind of view where you thought the entire framework of criminal law presupposes something like people ha doing morally wrongful behavior that can justify the possibility of, of retributive punishment, um, then you might go down this line where you think it's something like free will to responsibility to, um, to uh, blameworthy action to culpability to retributive uh, punishment. And then there's a whole sequence of things that you might think turn on whether or not we have free will. but. I want to note that you might think any of those things can those those linkages might be broken. I mean, that is, you might think, yeah, one thing that would be sufficient. The um, you might think something like uh, that uh, free will is if we had free will, it would be one of the kinds of things that could justify our being responsible and blameworthy. Mm -hmm. But it might turn out that there are actually multiple paths to justifying our responsibility and blameworthiness, some of which might not require free will. So it might turn out that if we had free will, it would be sufficient to justify praiseworthiness and blameworthiness. Mm -hmm. But if we don't, it's still an open question whether or not there are other ways to get there. And and so so there's one way you might stop the kind of the skeptical train. But it could also turn out that suppose you thought, no, 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 there's no other way to do it. Um, and so if you've got, if you don't have free will, then you don't have blameworthiness. But suppose you thought um, that, uh, but then you might have a different story about what the basis of criminal punishment is. And, and people, for example, have thought that retributivism or people roughly deserving punishment just simply in virtue of the, the moral quality of the act and the, and uh, and the nature of the actor. You could think that's justified independently or uh, of free will, or you might think that um, that uh, there are independent reasons to not be a retributivist anyway, so that whether or not we had free will isn't gonna affect the retributivism idea. So I say all of this not to take a stand on these particular issues. Of course, I have my own views about this, but partly just to to make it clear how many different steps and pieces are involved here, and that uh, this is one place where I think um, the one of the things that that philosophy has gotten right about this is to 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 disentangle the 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 number of steps between the the thought that free will is important and what hinges on it that it doesn't automatically follow um, that, uh, that, that free will to moral responsibility, then blameworthiness, then, then criminal punishment, and then retributive punishment. That set of linkages, every step of that is contestable, and they all spread apart in an interesting set of ways. And so even if it turns out that, that the kind of, as it were, naive thought about it is that really um, the stakes are something like retributive punishment, free will and retributive punishment, those are the real stakes. The part of what philosophers have figured out is you have to do a lot of work to actually show you get all of those pieces to hook up in the way which, as it were, folk thinking about these things, I think oftentimes tends to, to be shaped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think there's another question here that you that we also have to think about. So let's say that 
uh, it really was possible for either philosophers or scientists to determine that free will existed or not. Uh, but, on, uh, but let's say that it didn't. Uh, on the other hand, wouldn't we also have to take into account that, for example, certain types of beliefs that people might hold about uh, free will might have some causal relationship with their behavior and how they think about uh, other people's action. So, for example, it could be the case that free will didn't exist, but at the same time, because people hold certain beliefs about the culpability or responsibility or la lack thereof of other people's actions in different contexts and if there is, uh, for example, some intentionality or not. I mean, whatever the sorts of criteria that people take into account, that those kinds of beliefs would still have some, some bearing on how people deal with those sorts of questions and we would have to take that into account as well. Yeah, good. I, I mean, I think there are a lot of um, there are a lot of conceptual possibilities in here, and I think uh, that that the very kind of the pragmatic thought you're gesturing at that suppose we suppose we had agreement or consensus about what free will was. Suppose we had agreement and consensus that uh, that it doesn't exist, mm -hmm. uh, and suppose we had agreement and consensus, or at any rate, a lot of evidence that beliefs about free will had all sorts of important social regulation kinds of uh, features to it. Mm -hmm. Then I think then it's a kind of practical question about how to think about uh, what the advantages and disadvantages are. So it might turn out that uh, that there are practical upshots of widespread belief in free will, even if nobody um, actually has it. Another thing you could end up thinking is, uh, but even if that were true, it might still be an open question about whether on balance we're better off without the free will beliefs. Even if they do get us certain kinds of goods, there's an open question about, you might think about what the replacement um, you know, or what, um, you know, whether or not a world without that concept gets us certain kinds of gains over time. But I think another way you could also think about these things, and I think this is, uh, what I'm about to suggest here, I think there's not a lot of people who are inclined to go this route, but I think it's an interesting possibility. You know, you could think uh, that um, that one of the things that we can do sometimes is we can just re-anchor free will talk in things that get us certain kinds of goods. So, uh, you know, so you might have thought, for example, that uh, that in order for something to count as a uh, you know as a as the highest kind of crime there is as a felony or something like that you might have thought you know if we go back far enough in time that that those offenses had to be offenses against the gods or offenses against the the sacred order or something like that and it could turn out that 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 um, you know it's you might, might imagine a group of people become convinced that they were mistaken about the nature of the gods or the the sacred order um, it doesn't follow from that that uh, that therefore we should jettison the category of felonies. You could think something like, well, okay, so now we've learned something about the category of felonies that we should reconceive of the nature of the category of felonies. We, because why? Well, because it's it's super useful to us. It helps us reconfigure these things. So I think this is one of the things that can always happen. It might turn out that we think, yeah, 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 we had agreement that free will was some kind of metaphysical property. Um, it turns out that it, the, we have no good reason for thinking whatever that metaphysical property is that exists, but it is super important for social regulation. And so maybe what we have to do is reconceive of this, not as the kind of super demanding uh, uh, metaphysically or scientifically implausible property, but instead as a property that's more like the category of felonies. It picks out a set of features about us that matter and are useful for social regulation. Nobody thinks it has to be deeper than that. Um, and uh, you, you could imagine, this is the replacementist story. That So we just need to replace our old, confused, metaphysically laden, scientifically laden notion of free will with one that does the kind of social regulation work that, that, that 
could justify our ongoing talk in those ways. So that's another possibility. Not a lot of people find it appealing, but I think it's a, um, you know, I think it's it's part of the conceptual set here that follow. So just because you think the world isn't the way you thought it was doesn't mean that there aren't reasons to hold on to those ways of thinking and talking sometimes. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And what is your personal position on free will in terms of it existing or not? Or, or what are the kinds of questions that you think is important for philosophers to ask to tackle this issue? Yeah, so I'll, I'll answer the second question first, because it's part of the answer to the, the first question. So, mm -hmm. Uh, so I guess I think um, there are a lot of different things that are, are uh, interesting questions for philosophers to think about with respect to free will. That is, what are the requirements of free will? Is there reason for thinking on balance that we have it? Um, what should we think about uh, free will and its possibility under very concrete, specific social context? Do we have more or less free will under conditions of oppression or domination? Do we have uh, you know, it, do, can people have free will in, in degrees? And if so, what are the things that affect the, the degrees to which we have it or not? Do, you know, mental illness, delusional uh, uh, features of agency, do they impact free will or are they some independent thing? These, so th I think there's a ton of questions here that are super rich and interesting questions. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one of the things that's important for philosophers to do is to be clear about the kind of conceptual work that they're imagining their theory is is um, is uh, discharging. That is, what is the what's the kind of work that you want your theory to do? What's the kind of thing that anchors or is the the work of the concept of free will as one is understands it or is trying to build a theory for? And I think if we're clear about that piece, then some of the debates that that traditionally arise around these things um, go away or they don't become relevant in the same way. So, so partly it gets that backdrop. I tend to think, look, um, folks can be interested in free will for a wide range of different reasons. My own interest in it is primarily tied to questions about blameworthiness and culpability and responsibility practices. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, there I'm inclined to think that lots of the folk have what philosophers sometimes call incompatibilist views. So that I think lots of everyday folks, maybe not everybody, but a lot of us at least some of the time, are inclined to think that if determinism were true, then nobody would have any moral responsibility because they wouldn't have any free will. Yeah. And um, and I think that's a it's a widespread view. I don't know that everybody has it. There's empirical research on the extent to which people have this belief or not. Um, and most of this ex experimental work has been done primarily by philosophers. So it's one of the great irony that very few scientists who write about free will have bothered to look at the experimental work on free will. Uh, about what people's beliefs are about what free will involves and and the the data is a little complicated um, so it looks like uh, There are kind of distinct conditions under which people are inclined to think that free will is incompatibilist or free will is it has got incompatibilist features to it um, And then you can kind of shove people's beliefs around in different ways depending on what kinds of probes and tests you're giving but I'm content to say I think lots of people at least some of the time, have genuinely incompatibilist commitments or commitments about the nature of agency in the world such that incompatibilism is the most natural reading of their of their commitments. But then I think, okay, that, that's the story about what the folk think, right? And so you might, and you can imagine other analyses of what the folk think, like what do the folk think about race? What do the folk think about gender? What do the folk think about physics? Um, and I think then but that's just the beginning of the process. The next step is to ask ourselves, OK, so what's the best theoretical philosophical account we can give of the target concept? And, and the question is here, the target concept is some feature of agency in virtue of which it would make sense for us to be praiseworthy or blameworthy if we had it. Mm -hmm. And and I think on that part of the story, that part of the story, I, I'm inclined to accept a version of compatibilism. That is, I think that if we have certain kinds of reasons, responsive capacities, reasons, responsive capacities that are relatively easy for us to have or and they're compatible under with determinism, then if we have those things and insert some empirical bets about the way in which praise and blame operate on creatures like us, then I think we can justify the idea that people can merit uh, praise and blame, that they can be deserving of praise and blame. And the right way to understand that is that that 
free will plays exactly the conceptual role I suggested at the outset. It's the kind of feature such that if we have it and we exercise it in certain kinds of ways, then we can be deserving of praise and blame. And the justification for that isn't that it captures everyday ordinary thinking about it, but that it captures the conceptual role that we said that we wanted for a concept of free will. And there I think, so that's the kind of view I have. It's one that partitions these questions. And I think um, that kind of view that says uh, what we ought to think about free will and moral responsibility at the end of theorizing is different and, and importantly at odds with features of what everyday thinking about these things looks like makes the view revisionist. And I think, so I'm a revisionist about free will and moral responsibility. I think the folk are broadly incompatibilists, but I think um, when we're done with the theory and we're careful about why we want the concept and what work we expect the concept to do and what's required in order to justify and explain those practices, we can get by on a compatibilist account. But it is a departure from ordinary ways of thinking, but it's a principled departure. It's a departure that isn't just arbitrary. It's not a cheat. It's not a wretched subterfuge in all the traditional ways that compatibilists get uh, get objected to. It's instead of, well, look, this is what happens when you do good theor theorizing. And in the same way in which I think the first person that came up with the chemical theory of water, and they said, no, 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 water is H2O. It's not one of the basic indivisible substances of the universe. The objection wasn't, oh, you've switched topics because it's no longer. And it, because I think, look, the thing we're interested in, the, 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 the target is this everyday business that you and I do of praising and blaming people and these kinds of assessments. And I think that's the feature in the world that is either justifiable or not. And we might have thought the thing that justified it was a kind of metaphysically robust conception of responsibility. But it turns out something thinner can do that. And, and that thinner thing we tend to have. So that's the view. Mm -hmm. And do you think that the extent to which people are worthy of praise or blame depends on the kinds of psychological features that they have access to? I mean, uh, hmm. let's say that, for example, certain people, because they are handicapped on, uh, in some way or because they have some brain lesion, for example, or a brain tumor that influences the degree of self-control that they have access to, would you say that those kinds of people, for example, would, uh, couldn't be held to a high degree of uh, praise or blame or not? Yeah, these, this is a great question. So, uh, um, so I think there are cases and then there are cases. Um, and by that, what I mean is that, uh, that uh, different cases we're going to get different answers on depending on what the, the impairment is and the nature of the impairment. So I don't think it follows from the fact that somebody is, um, is psychologically or, neuro, uh, uh, or neurologically atypical. It doesn't automatically follow from that that they can't be praiseworthy and blameworthy. Okay. I think the, the relevant question is whether or not they've got the ability to roughly recognize and suitably respond to moral reasons. And it could be that certain kinds of impairments uh, or uh, atypical configurations of psychology and, or, or neurology might, uh, might make it harder without making it impossible. Mm -hmm. And it might be the case that uh, and it might be the case that in some cases it might even, you know, it's conceivable that it could even enhance one's ability to recognize and respond to certain kinds of moral considerations. And so I think all of this is oftentimes super contextual and really complicated. There's oftentimes not immediately straightforward answers uh, to the question. But, uh, but I think as a kind of as, as a general rule of thumb, that's the, that's the basic picture is, is the thing we, we want to know is, are they, uh, is the person we're considering, do they have a suitable degree of sensitivity to moral considerations and do they have the ability to appropriately respond to them? And if they do, then it doesn't matter whether or not, you know, there's a tumor there or whether the tumor in fact enables those sorts of things or gets in the way. The thing that licenses our praising and blaming um, just is the presence or absence of that capacity to recognize and respond to moral considerations. Modulo some other things in the background, but that's the core of the, the, of the account. Mm -hmm. uh, if we are able to determine the degree of blameworthiness of people in general, 
does that translate directly into how we should write our laws? Or, I mean, is there any direct route from uh, determining blameworthiness to how we should punish people, for example? So I don't know that there's a direct route, but I do think that there are a ton of indirect routes here. And the, and and what these indirect, uh, the nature of these indirect routes turns on a web of really complicated, difficult questions. So, I, I mean, you know, general rule of thumb, when anybody tells you that the answers are straightforward to questions about free will and punishment, they're either lying or don't know what they're talking about. Um, because but by that, I mean, I, I just think like these issues are super complicated. And and one of the, the recurring challenges here is is uh, is always the possibility of independent justifications for things that we're doing uh, for reasons that we thought were connected to considerations X, but it turns out considerations Y are sometimes sufficient for doing the same activity, even if we are not ordinarily thinking that Y is implicated in, the, in that activity. And I think this is, and I, I mentioned this partly in context with punishment because you could think, I mean, so, you know, famously, there are all of these different justifications for punishment. And in criminal law, oftentimes what you get are uh, amongst uh, amongst criminal law theorists is a uh, often, oh, at least amongst practitioners of criminal law, an, a rough and ready understanding of the kind of multiple sources of justification for why the criminal law has the structure it does. And so, you know, it, even if it turned out that, for example, uh, that we ca came to have a view where we thought nobody was genuinely blameworthy in any interesting and deep sense for anything that they did, and, and we thought this undercuts retributivism in the law, uh, I think there might be cases where, where the criminal law has the shape it does only because of the retributivist elements. But by and large, the criminal law, in some sense, it, is almost justificatorily uh, overdetermined. That is, the questions about social regulation and deterrence and um, and uh, and you know, kind of crime reduction models and so on, oftentimes give lots of reason for having the criminal law having roughly the shape that it does. There might be cases under which retributive justifications are uniquely the only thing that explains why the, the criminal law has the shape that it does. And so in those cases, I think those would be cases to look. And but I think it's it's super interesting and really complicated in ways that aren't. Um, immediately intuitive. So just to give one quick example of this. Mm -hmm. So think about, um, you know, the, the uh, so when, uh, so, so there's like attitudes sometimes around people who don't know much about the history of criminal law to say something like it was the rise of retributivism that led to um, enormous prison se sentences and super lengthy prison, uh, uh, prison sentences. And maybe that's true, but, but it, uh, it's also atypical against the backdrop of the history of uh, of prison and incarceration. So one of the reasons why in the 1970s, uh, criminal law theorists backed away from uh, um, uh, backed away from purely deterrence kinds of models and started appealing to retributivism more heavily was because it was thought that retributivism would constrain the amount of prison time that people were doing. Because the thought would be, no, 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 this reintroduces a constraint of proportionality into the into the punishment. And that if all you were doing was deterrence, then in principle, you can eliminate social risk by never letting criminals back out into society. But if we now inject retributivism into the system and, or, or uh, or, or uh, enhance the amount of focus on retributivism, that this will constrain prison sentences, fewer people will do uh, lengthy prison time. And, and that was part of the justification for the appeal and reintroduction and emphasis on retributivism in the criminal law. So this is the sense in which I think it's actually really not at all clear to what extent retributive justifications are creating more prison sentences and longer prison sentences or whether or not they're constraining it. And oftentimes I think what ends up happening is that the theorists, um, the things we care about and worry about are, depending on what country you're in, not at all connected to how the criminal law is set up. And the things that are driving criminal law, for example, in the United States oftentimes have to do with politics and, uh, and political views and political commitments in ways that are mostly detached from questions about uh, you know, whether or not people really are getting what they deserve and what, you know, the punishment is for this crime versus that crime. Mm -hmm. 
since we're talking about the legal system, I guess that w there's one big set of prob problems that people pay attention to nowadays a lot that have to do with social justice. Uh, I mean, are there any uh, environmental factors, let's say, that you think are important to consider? Uh, so, for example, uh, sometimes people say that because certain people live in dire conditions, like, for example, they are low in socioeconomic status, they live in crime-ridden neighborhoods or something like that, that, uh, I mean, in some way or another, they at least suggest that those people uh, shouldn't be as blameworthy as others who live in uh, more favorable conditions. Do you think that that is a thing to take seriously and that also connects in any way with questions surrounding free will or not? Yeah, good. So, uh, so the second question first, uh, um, yes, I think some of these questions are very tied into free will. So if you thought free will was that feature of agency and virtue of which it makes sense to praise and blame people for what they do in a kind of morally loaded sense. So if you thought something like that, then it does seem to me that, that whether or not uh, environments or contexts um, affect people's agency uh, just is a kind of question or can be uh, can be a question about whether or not uh, people's free will and moral responsibility is affected by social deprivation in some way shape or form mm -hmm. so so I think there is a there's a very natural connection here now I guess I'm inclined to think that um, that we're still in some sense though this kind of the version of this question is very old it, there's some sense in which we're still very early days in trying to understand how these things interact with one another so to, to one way to kind of get at the kind of question you're asking is to just note there is a kind of funny dilemma here about how we think about these things where on the one hand it seems uh, if somebody was sub subjected to whatever kind of social deprivation you want to focus on, whether it's economic or, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, of political opportunities or in terms of, um, you know, social ties or what have you, uh, that it, it can seem a bit kind of cold hearted or insensitive to the fact of their deprivation and the way in which this might have affected their ability to, to recognize and respond to moral reasons. Uh, it seems a little cold-hearted to say that that yeah, yeah you were at massive disadvantage and massive incentives to do bad things, but we're not going to pay any attention to that. We're just going to praise and blame you as though you had all the opportunities in the world. On the flip side, though, it looks like it's a failure of, or there's a room for a failure to respect the agency of people, uh, even under conditions of deprivation. Um, if we're too quick to say, oh no no no, because you were exposed to some deprivation. Uh, you aren't blameworthy. And I think part of the, the kind of the, the head spinning difficulty of this is what's true at population levels um, is oftentimes not true in the case of individuals who are members of the population. So it might turn out that just as a, as a matter of fact, we, we know that, for example, when, when people are under conditions of um, scarcity or, uh, or, you know, kind of, uh, little opportunity there, there, the, the scope of their attention is going to shrink from long-term thinking to short-term thinking. And there, and, and when people's, you know, focus from long, sh shortens from long to short term, and then opportunities to solve immediate resource problems come up, then people are way more likely to take those choices in, in those moments. Um, and that's just a general feature about human beings and uh, and about attentional resources and ability to kind of sustain um, sustain course of actions plans you know, over time. Okay, so so that's just a feature about human beings. But it could turn out that they're going to be for any group of human beings. They're going to be some folks who, yeah, despite facing some of those advantages, nevertheless are able to sustain long term thinking even in the face of, of fairly robust scarcity or they're gonna be able to withstand temptation to cave in. And, and there's some variation among individuals that way. And so that, that kind of fact, I think, makes it complicated to draw sweeping conclusions from uh, the way in which scarcity and deprivation in general might affect people's agency to individual particular cases. 
So there's one example about why it's just really complicated to know what to say about these things. But I think in many ways, those kinds of questions are, to my mind, some of the most rich and interesting questions about what free will and blameworthiness in, in the real world would, would look, what they look like and what the challenges are for thinking about them and where there's ample room for philosophers and, and legal theorists and scientists to, to try to study the conditions under which our agency operates. And in, in some sense, I, I think there is a way in which many of the questions that we tend to think of as metaphysical questions about free will are actually better understood as kind of broadly political or social questions about have we built environments that are conducive to people having the kinds of agency that we want them to have. Mm -hmm. So it's always a relevant question to ask. I mean, trying to understand how the environmental conditions might affect the degree of agency that people have. That's right. Yeah. And I think this is this is in many ways the, the great underdeveloped uh, the, and and uh, and uh, inadequately considered part about human agency is our agency is not agency full stop. It's always mm -hmm. agency in a context or agency in a set of circumstances. Agency that has uh, you know that faces a world of incentives and possibilities and social scaffolding and support for the ways in which we choose and the and the valuations of the options in front of the, us and the kinds of opportunities that are in front of us. And and I think there's some sense in which Free will isn't entirely in the head. Free will is a matter about how features about our agency interact with environments, and that's where all the that's where an enormous amount of theoretical work remains to be done. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you now, because in your work uh, I read you talking about uh, the the importance of history for moral responsibility and responsible agency. Could you mm -hmm. explain? what history uh, means in that case and what is the role that it, pl that it plays in moral responsibility? Yeah, good. So, um, so the way in which the, 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 the particular set of, uh, of articles and the kind of philosophical dispute about the, the sometimes it's called the history structure debate in, um, in free will it, uh, it, amongst philosophers, it's got a very specific version of this this problem, and the the very specific version is just something like this: that is, um, that uh, once you've identified whatever the the requisite psychological structures are uh, for for free will, and whatever whatever you think they are, um, that once you've identified what those things are, and you check whether or not an agent has those things, then the question is: have you answered everything or do you know everything you need to know in order to say whether or not the person has free will mm -hmm. and there's a way in which some some people have thought well no you don't know everything that you need to know and unless you know some additional features that is you need to know something about their history and in particular whether or not they identify with those psychological structures or whether or not they played the a right the right kind of role in their adoption whether or not in in, in uh, john fisher and mark revisa's words uh whether or not they own those psychological structures in a, in a particularly kind of privileged way so put that way one way to get at what the difference would be is you might imagine um two agents who have psychologically identical structures uh but one got the psychological structures because they just came into existence right here, right now, with no prior history. The other got the psychological structures through a complicated history that included, amongst other things, taking ownership of these psychological features, thinking of these psychological features as central to who they were, and and then you know whatever the rest of your story is about what ownership consists in. On something like a Fisher Revisa view. Uh, these are very different agents. So one would have free will and the other one wouldn't um, because one satisfies a historical condition and the other one doesn't. So uh, so, so John Fisher and, uh, and Al Mealy and Michael McKenna and I've all written about this and taking different various versions of these kinds of uh, positions. And so the, the kind of the version of the view I like is one that, that in some sense looks like it's biting the bullet. I mean, I, I'm inclined to think Look, so long as you have the relevant features, you're able to recognize and suitably respond to, to moral considerations, then you're responsible for things that flow from you having those features. Um, 
Now, whether or not having those features is going to be sufficient for free will, there I'm inclined to think there are there are some things outside of the head that matter, the social environment and the opportunities that are available to you. Those are going to matter for whether or not you can be held to account for what you do. But the but it's not the fact of history that matters. It's the fact of features about you plus your ability to to use those things in the responsibility relevant way in whatever environment you're in. That's that's what does the work. But the debate is about that that history structure debate is about whether or not there's something like an ownership condition or whether it matters how you got those reasons, responsive abilities, whether they were implanted or whether or not they you disassociate from them and so on. Mm-hmm. And that would include all sorts of factors, like, for example, genetic, environmental, contextual, and all of those things, or not? Well, so it depends on the versions of the view that you've got. So there's a there uh, the 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 fight in the literature has been largely about whether or not a historical ownership condition was required. But there are different versions um, that float around out there so, uh, about how these these conditions matter. So on the really on on relatively, um, I, you know, I don't know how the the right way to characterize this, but I suppose on thin versions of it, that is ones that just say no, no, no. All we care about is the psychological whether or not you've got the relevant psychological or agential features. So the kind of view I I tend to like modulo the bit about the opportunities in the environment or something like that but but the the one that looks to the psychological features that kind of story tends to be one that just doesn't care about the the genetics it doesn't care about the history so it could just turn out that i mean so one way to put it is what i care about is whether or not you're able to recognize and respond to moral considerations And if the reason why you're able to respond to moral, recognize and respond to moral considerations in the right way is because you got good genetics or bad genetics with respect to those abilities, or whether or not it was because it got implanted in you by a neuroscientist, or whether or not it, um, you got it not, be, it was going to be super hard for you to have those abilities given your genetics, but because you were exposed to just the right upbringing or had just the right people teaching you things. Um, those are all irrelevant for the question for me uh, on on my view. They're irrelevant uh, to the question about whether or not in the here and now you are morally responsible for what you do. Mm-hmm. That's entirely settled by just look to the features. Do you have the ability to recognize and respond to moral considerations? If you do, now we can justify why praise and blame makes sense, why it would be true to say that you're responsible. And that's that's the story. But but of course, there are folks who disagree and think, no, 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 that's too high a cost to pay, that it could turn out that you could be, as it were, manipulated into having these sorts of things through, you know, no uh, action on your part. Somebody just implants the ability to recognize and respond to moral considerations in you. And now you're responsible going forward. Mm-hmm. Some people think that's a that's a problem. I'm inclined to think, no, that just follows from us understanding what the nature of responsibility is and what it is to hold people to account. Mm-hmm. But th- that raises a very interesting question. So uh, if you say that, for example, if a neuroscientist simply implanted that ability, like, for example, some ability having to do with agency in your brain, in your mind, that that doesn't matter. Would it follow from that that if that sort of thing would be possible, we should pursue it? I mean, that we should really tweak with people's brains and minds to increase the level or degree of agency that they have? Yeah, so this is a great question. So um, so I do think, so if it turned out that we could reliably do this, and we could reliably do this uh, in, a, uh, in a sort of, let's presume, a cost-effective way, right? I mean, if it turns out in order to do it, it costs $10 trillion dollars to do it, and it would bankrupt the global economy to do it to three people, it's not obvious that it would be worth our time to, to do that. So... Um, So I think, you know, those would, so if it was, if the technology was reliable, safe, ubiquitously available, um, and, uh, and relatively inexpensive, uh, and with, uh, you know, no, uh, no uh, sort of other obvious risks to I- employment of the technology, then I'm inclined to think that to the extent to which responsibility is valuable and important and so on, then that would be a reason to, to take this possibility seriously. Now, I want to be careful here. The reason why I say take this possibility seriously is because uh, 
uh, one of the things that we could conclude, uh, so go back to the thought I was mentioning earlier. So I'm inclined to think that one of the things that justifies our blaming one another and holding each other to account is that we're the right kinds of agents. But the right kinds of agents for what? Well, for these practices over time doing a better job of making us recognize and respond to moral reasons. Now, if it turned out that praising and blaming practices did a terrible job of making us respond to moral reasons, or it turned out that if we got somehow better at responding to moral reasons, that lots of terrible things would follow. I don't know what that would be, but you can imagine. Then that would be a reason for us to be really cautious about the technology. So just because something secures something of some value to us doesn't mean that there aren't other values that couldn't be implicated and that would weigh against that. And so I do think you know, this is so if we developed a technology for making us better at recognizing and responding to moral reasons and it was cheap and easy to do, there would be lots of other questions we'd want to ask about coercion and about, you know, whether or not people were freely selecting these the usage of these technologies or if it was top down enforced because there could be values of independence that might matter and so on. Uh, but but other things being equal, I, I'm inclined to think, yeah, in a world in which we uh, that it was relatively easy for us to become more sensitive and responsive to moral reasons is a better world than a world under which we're less responsive to what moral reasons there are. And if we can make people better in that way, then that's a thing to do. Mm -hmm. So let me just ask you one last question. Uh, what about the role of luck in, in all of these sorts of issues that we've been exploring today? Yeah, good. I, I so um, so I think luck is a it's a um, it's one way into the free will problem, and uh, that is worries about look. You know, it's just an it's an it's an accident that you were born speaking Portuguese, and it's an accident that I was born speaking English, and it was an accident that uh, you know that the both of us are uh, you know ha have some competence for academic work. Uh, but that, uh, you know, neither of us could be playing in the English Premier League. Um, I mean, maybe you could play in the English Premier League. I don't know. Uh, but I certainly couldn't play in the English Premier League, right? So, so these are all accidents. And you might think w a huge range of our social practices turn on the fact of these accidents. Um, and, and you might worry that if amongst the, the, the set of these practices that, turn, that, that, that are sort of products of accidents, including our praising and blaming, that that could be worrisome. Um, so I think there, there is a real worry there. There's an, uh, a real uh, a real way to get these things up and, or, you know, a real way to get, get into the free will problem via worries about luck. But I guess I'm inclined to think something like the following. The, the right way to understand what's the, um, what, or the right way to think about uh, responsibility, how we ought to think about responsibility, is we ought to think about responsibility as roughly something like a, um, a set of social practices that are justified and bent and oriented around making us more responsive to what moral reasons there are. And it's going to turn out that because of features of luck, some of us are going to be better and worse at that. And some of us are going to be so bad at it that we're not even in the game, that we're just insensitive to the kinds of things such that the game doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to apply the, the rules to us. And others of, of us are going to be, for better or for worse, really sensitive to that. But the practice, in order for the practice to be justified, in order for us to ha be licensed in making these assessments and so on, it doesn't have to be the case that uh, there's no blame at all, or sorry, that there's no luck at all in the system. The system can tolerate a certain amount of luck. What justifies us doing participating in the system is that it gets an improvement of our agency over time. And so I do think luck is a real feature. Uh, no good story about free will and responsibility is going to be able to eradicate the possibility of some amount of luck. But, not, but the mere fact of luck doesn't by itself preclude the possibility of responsibility. Um, any more than the fact of luck precludes any number of social practices we have. And what's required is that we have a good justification for why we retain these social practices, even in the face of luck. But this is quite common. We have lots and lots of social practices where we think luck affects the social practice, whether it's football or the criminal law or what grades you get in school. But we hold on to those practices because we have an explanation for them. And I think that free will and moral responsibility are going to have to go that way, too. Okay, great. So let's end the interview here, Dr. Vargas. Just before we go, 
Are there any good places on the internet where people can find your work? So I've got a website, uh, VargasPhilosophy.com, where all, all of my uh, papers are, at least the, the preprints, or not the preprints, the, uh, the, the last drafts before they went to press. Phil Papers is always great. Um, there's a, you know, a world of philosophy papers to be had there, not just by me, but by the, the, the rest of the profession in many ways. Um, but yeah, th those would be the natural places to look. Okay, great. So I will be leaving links to your work in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Vargas, it was a real pleasure to have you on the show and to talk to you. So thank you for accepting the invitation. Thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been doing regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep this channel sustainable, I would really like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Any amount, even just one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, you can also support me via Subscribestar or PayPal. And please share the video, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Yane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, John Connors, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Dr. Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervois, and Bo Weingard, and also my three producers, Isar Webb, Rosie, and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.